Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, here with a feature review of the MSI MPG Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi. That might be a bit of a mouthful, but this is a pretty awesome Z790 Intel board from MSI with a number of really interesting highlights to it. Now, I have built this inside the Liam Lee Evo RGB, and the specs of it, as well as links to those videos, are in the description if you're curious to find out more about it, because I have, as you can see, built it in various different setups. But in this video, I want to talk to you about the interesting highlights of this board that include not only the ability to install multiple NVMe drives, but also up to a Gen 5 drive. And I'm using the Corsair MP700 Pro here as an example, which is a chunky little NVMe SSD with its own heatsink and SATA power required for a little fan on there. Interesting because it goes up to 12,000 megabytes a second read speed. So that's pretty impressive. And you can get that on this motherboard but there are some caveats to that because if you populate that slot along with multiple other ports that are available on this motherboard, I'll get to in a minute, you'll find that you do risk halving the PCIe lanes for your GPU, which can then lead to a reduction in performance, which I have actually gone into some depth on in a separate video, which I'll link down below. This is a Z790 board, which means it supports three generations of Intel CPUs, 12th, 13th, and 14th gen. For this build, I'm using an i9-13900K, but I'm also going to show you what to do if you want to use a 14th gen CPU in it. You'll notice other highlights include Wi-Fi 7 capabilities, and there is an antenna in there for that. It also supports up to 7,800 megahertz overclocked DDR5 RAM, and it does have four slots for that, but I'm using two sticks. Of course, there's Vengeance. RGB RAM, you'll see. I want to show off a few things of interest that you get in the box for a start and then talk about some of the setup process and the things of interest that I found along the way. This is that wireless antenna that you'll need for your Wi-Fi, so don't forget to connect that if you're using Wi-Fi. And you'll also find these M2 locker screws included in here. These are additional screws for your NVMe drives, which have a latch functionality on them, which means in theory, once you've screwed them into the motherboard, you don't need a screwdriver. There's also a USB thumbstick included with networking drivers and other things that you'll require on there. And then a RGB extension cable or adapter, which I didn't find I used, so you don't need to worry necessarily if you don't. And there are also some SATA cables included in here for data connections on SSDs and hard disk drives as well. Point of note, because there are a few different connection options on this board for those. And then there's this nifty adapter for your front panel connection. So your reset switch, your power switch, hard drive LEDs and other things from your case, which is a little bit fiddly, but will allow you to convert those connections from your case into a simple single plug that can then plug into your motherboard. And I'll show you where later on, because I want to highlight some of the things, where they're located, and things to bear in mind with those connections later. Now, I end up not using this one, but if you have got a case with separate connections on it like this, you can actually make your life a lot easier for connecting out to the other world, which is pretty nice. It's sealed within a anti-static bag, which obviously you need to take out of there before you go about building. And just make sure you're grounded before you do any of the building process, as I am. But I wanted to just talk to you about some of the things of interest here because there are quite a few. This is a very nice motherboard with a number of interesting highlights to it. I'm going to show off all the different things, including how to update the BIOS, which I'll leave timestamps in the bottom so you can jump straight to those things. But here's a quick look at the board from various angles because I want to show you, for example, that there's only one system fan header at the top and then most of the others are down the bottom, which is mildly inconvenient in my build. And something to bear in mind, you can see there's multiple system fan headers down here next to your internal USB connections and only a single one at the top alongside the CPU fan connections. You've then got a rainbow connector down the bottom here for your 5 volt RGB header and then a number of other connectors too. And I want to show off some of those. You will also see a lot of heat shielding for your NVMe SSDs and this board does require two 8-pin CPU power connectors in the top left. On the I.O. side, you'll see there's a lot of USB connections with 2.5 gigahertz USB-C connectors too, and both DisplayPort and HDMI out if you're using a Intel CPU which has inboard graphics, so you can use that. But also Wi-Fi 7 antenna ports there, screw those in, don't forget to use that antenna to make the most of the signal there. Now there are six SATA connectors on the right hand side for connecting up hard disk drives and SSDs 
And that's obviously fairly straightforward and plugging those in and good access to those as well. But one of the other things that I found interesting is this board also has two additional ones down the bottom, which is unusual. So you've got options there. Now, underneath the heat shielding, this top one, for example, pops off with real ease. You see, it doesn't even held down with a screw, but instead a little clip. On the underside, you'll find multiple stickers and thermal pads. And it's worth noting that if you want to use a Gen 5 drive, like this Fire Cuda from Seagate, which is a 540 series drive, then that's the slot to use. And that will give you the best speeds up there because that's Gen 5, but the rest of them are Gen 4 PCIe slots. So it's worth noting that. But you will notice that, as I said, this just clips back into place. So you've seen that little latch on the screw that holds it in place, and then that just notches back in. Now, for this build, I'm actually using two Gen 5 drives, but obviously there's only one port that will work with. And I wanted to try out the MP700, which you'll see obviously has its own massive heatsink on there. One of the things that I noticed is those latches sometimes are a little bit fiddly, so I did have to use a screwdriver to loosen them up sometimes. Now down the bottom, you'll also find two other sections of thermal pads and shielding for more MVME ports. That's the good thing about this board is it can take multiple drives. So you can see under this one, we've got two other ports in here that you can easily access. And again, more thermal pads and stickers for performance reasons. And these are actually very good and keep things running cool. I've done a separate video testing whether you need those thermal pads and how much difference these heat sinks make. And they do actually have quite an impact. So I would recommend using them unless you've got a drive which has a built-in heat shield already as I have. But you can see that I'm populating multiple ports. And I'm doing this intentionally because I wanted to be able to test whether all these ports run at the right speed during use. Obviously, you might be using multiple drives, perhaps for videos, for games, for your OS and other things. That's how I operate on a day-to-day -day basis, for example. And you might do the same. And they might be of different variations. See, I've got a couple of Corsair drives. I've got the Fire Cuda and I've got WD Black and other things. So a bit of a mishmash of drives in there. But checking that out to see how many positions you've got. So you've got five different ports that you can put NVMEs in. Those bottom four are all Gen 4, and I am happy to report that my testing shows that they do actually run at the right speeds as well across the board. So that's pretty nice. However, more on that in a little while, because the Fire Cooler won't, as I'll show you. Now, I'm using an i9-13900K for this build, but as I said, you can use a 14th Gen. So I'll show you how to use a 14th Gen CPU later on, because you do need to do a BIOS update, so it's worth noting that. This board supports up to four sticks of DDR5, although I will say I've always found two sticks to be more stable with DDR5 in here, and you need to use slot A2 and B2 for maximum stability, and turn XMP on, which I'll get to later on. Now on the right-hand side, you've got USB-A and USB-C connections here. I'm just showing you these outside the case, show where they are and locations for them. Down the bottom right is your front panel connector. You see, as I was saying, the one from my case is a single connector like that, but that's the same what would happen if you use the adapter. On the left hand side you've got your front panel 3.5mm connection there, so four headsets, and then you also have a J Rainbow connection which is a 5 volt RGB header if you need it. There's also a 12 volt one you'll notice on the left hand side there as well. So there's plenty of connections here, no problems. Now I want to give a quick overview of the power cabling for this. This is a Colink thousand watt power supply unit I'm using and I want to show you the 24 pin and the two 8 pin power connectors just so that you're aware of what to plug in if you do end up getting this board. So to make the most of it obviously you need to have the 24 pin plugged in as a minimum and that plugs in there with a little notch on the right hand side and connects up and then the two 8 pin CPU power connectors go in the top left and there was obviously ensure that you can do things like overclocking the CPUs getting enough juice especially if you're using an i9 or you're planning on doing any overclock and you want to make sure you plug all these in. I regularly get asked whether you should. The answer is yes. If you're going to be using a board like this and a high-end CPU and you have the option, plug your CPU power connectors in. Don't skimp on things unnecessarily. But now we've got a setup here which is coming together nicely. Obviously, we wouldn't plug these power cables in like this, but I wanted to demonstrate where they were plugged in so you get a rough idea of it. Above the RAM, we've also got a CPU, fan power, and AIO pump headers as well, next to two more RGB power connectors for RGB connections. So the only downsides I really found with this board when setting it up is the lack of system fan headers anywhere apart from on the bottom, 
which did make things a little bit fiddly and could be problematic if you've got a mass of fans in your case. So the board's now set up and I'm putting it inside the system so we can go about testing things. And we're running Windows 11 here alongside Corsair's IQ Link system, which I've done separate videos on in the description. But as I said earlier on, one of the first things to note is that even in the specs, the motherboard warns you that you can use a Gen 5 drive on the top slot. So only the top slot will support NVMe SSDs at Gen 5. But doing so, populating it will half the number of PCIe lanes available to your graphics card. You want to use the top slot for your graphics card to make sure it gets maximum speed. But if you're also combining that with a Gen 5 NVMe, you're knocking the number of lanes down to 8. This is immediately obvious if you're using something like Hardware Info 64 to give you an overview of it. Because you'll see that this is PCIe X16, but it's running at 8x lanes. So obviously not ideal, at least on paper. I've done some testing on this and I'll link to that video in the description where I wanted to put it through and see what difference this actually made, both with and without the drive. So if you don't put a Gen 5 drive in that top slot, you can actually run it at 16 lanes. But you can see if we go into the settings here that it is unfortunately running at 8 lanes with it populated. How much difference does this actually make is probably going to vary depending on the games you're playing and also other things. So for example, I ran some tests at 1080p because I wanted to see how much difference that made. You can see Rainbow Six Siege, 421 FPS with the eight lanes and 478 with 16 lanes. Now you might find if you're running a 4K game or more intensive ray tracing games that you do get a bigger reduction. So it's worth noting that. Unfortunately, I don't have a 4K monitor to be able to test it at the moment, but I did want to demonstrate these things. Lower scores in 3D Mark, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla and other things two but not so shocking that it would be a real problem so i want to note that i think for most people especially if you're playing at 1080p you'll probably find that populating that m2 slot and still playing games you won't notice a massive degradation in quality despite losing this so point of interest there now i mentioned earlier on that i was using the fire 540 in the system as well as that corsair drive you can see it's appearing in here and one of the things is obviously this is a Gen 5 drive, but now it's on the board and I've actually put it in one of the lower slots. It notes that it's Gen 5, but it doesn't run at Gen 5 speeds. And that's one of the things of the sort of backwards compatibility with these Gen 5 drives. They will work in PCIe 4 slots, but you're obviously not going to get maximum speed. So instead of uh, 10, 11,000 megabytes a second, I'm getting 7. So you are reducing the amount of speed that you will get out of the drive, but it still shows that despite that, the board is still gonna run it at a good speed. Now I found the comparable speeds from the crucial drive that I had in there, WD Black, SN850, and other drivers, they ran at the speeds that I expected from them, considering their PCA Gen 4 as well. So something to note, basically, if you want Gen 5, you have to use that top slot. If you do, you risk reducing the number of lanes on your graphics card. But something to keep in mind, you can still use Gen 5 in other places. You can see with the Corsair drive, we are getting 12,000 megabytes a second read speed, 11,000 megabytes a second write speeds at the top end. So we're getting some pretty good speeds out of it. Now, what happens if you want to put a 14th gen CPU into this board like i9-14900K? Now, this board will support it, and so it is possible to do. However, you do need to update the BIOS first. If you head over to the support section on MSI's website for this motherboard and go into the drivers section and then BIOS, you'll notice there are a number of different BIOS releases in there. Make sure you check to see what version you're on currently, but you'll see that this version supports 14th gen. And then the later one also supports some extra things for overclocking rules, for optimizing for i9 CPUs and for APO functions as well. So it may well be that you have to update, especially if you've gone for that. So I'll quickly show you the steps for updating it. Download your BIOS, get a flash drive, a USB drive, format that to FAT32, make sure that's formatted and empty and clean and ready to go. And I'm gonna quickly show you the process for then setting it up. So we're then going to extract the files from the BIOS that we've downloaded from the MSI website and then send them over to the drive that we're using. In these initial steps, I'm gonna show you how to use the onboard hardware to flash the BIOS, assuming you haven't got access to Windows because you're using a 14th gen. So what we need to do is to put that file onto the USB drive, making sure it's fully extracted first, and then set it up there. 
and then I'd make a copy of it and then rename it to msi.rom. Now there's two steps to this. Essentially, I'm going to show you both ways to update the BIOS in case you need to know. So you can skip a bit further forward if you want to see the standard version. But in this one, I'm basically using it so you don't have to power the PC on first. So once that drive's set up, put it into the back of the motherboard in the spot that is marked for BIOS flash. You'll see it here, so flash BIOS and that USB port there. Clearly marked, put it in that spot. Then you don't need to turn the PC on for this. I'd make sure everything's set up and powered, but don't turn it on. Then you need to press the flash BIOS button here underneath the clear CMOS button. What this does is it goes through the process of updating your BIOS without actually powering the system on, which is pretty neat. What you will see is there's a little LED indicator which shows up red and you can just see it through one of the other SSD ports here. It will flash and this process does take around five minutes. So you do need to have some patience and don't panic if it doesn't work immediately. Also, the system will turn on and off during that process as well. So you may see that happen. So basically have some patience and wait for the system to fully set up in this process here. You can see it sort of going through that process where it's flicking on and off. And this took some time. And this is one way to do it, but eventually, hopefully, it will then be able to boot into Windows, assuming you've got Windows installed on a drive, and you'll be able to use the 14th gen CPU. Now, you can also see the BIOS version in your BIOS. So if you hit delete after the PC is booted, you can then go into the BIOS and you'll see the BIOS version and the build date on there. And that's now the updated version of the BIOS as it is. Now, naturally, you may want to do this in a slightly different way. So you may want to go into the BIOS, then click on M flash instead. M flash will take you into the BIOS update options in a sort of BIOS setting. If you're doing a 13th series CPU, for example, but you still want to update the BIOS for other reasons, you can go in here, look at your build number, obviously find the version, make sure you're updating from one to another. So you can see the current build version and then your new build version that you've got for your drive. Find the drive on there, find the file that is currently labeled, make sure it's reading from that, and then it will go through the BIOS update process. Again, this takes some time to do. Now, back in the standard BIOS, I want to show you a few other settings that are worth looking at. You'll see if you go under memory that we've got XMP turned on. So it's XMP profile one which ensures that that RAM is running at the right speed. It's important to turn that on to get maximum speed out your DDR5 RAM. And then if you go into the advanced settings and then head over to the PCIe settings, you can see resizable bar support. That's also enabled. Make sure that's set up to make the most of your GPU, especially if you're using a 40 series like I am. And then we got the finished system. Now I'm happy to report that of a couple of things that I pointed out with this motherboard, it's been really stable and a good system. I've had no problems with XMP running on it. It runs really smoothly. It's been perfectly fine for gamers, given some good results, and it's been easy to set up and it looks the part in here. Obviously you can do some tweaking to the RGB lighting with MSI's Mystic Light and get access to other things in MSI Center. Hopefully this has been useful. If it has, be sure to check out the links in the description to other related videos and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.